being a, a graduate student, we're giving these amazing employment opportunities. We get to be mentors for undergraduate students. And uh, talking to many of the second and third year undergraduate students, um, I realized that they were in a very, very similar position that I was as a third year student. A lot of the same struggles, worrying about grades, um, just worrying about balancing school life and social life. And uh, I was capable uh, to break through those struggles eventually. And I wanted to share my story with you as to how I did that and then how, where I got to today. Um, I was a third year student. I did my undergraduate degree in health sciences at Mount Royal University. I completed it in 2012 and um, I was struggling. I was a third year student. Um, I lacked direction, lacked motivation. My grades were extremely average. I was a B, B plus student. I went to, I would say, maybe 50, 40 to 50% of my classes. I rarely went, I didn't really care. Um, I liked some of the material, but uh, I was just intimidated. I was intimidated by people around me. They all wanted to go to med school. Um, I didn't necessarily. I was intimidated by hearing people's success stories. We all heard about the nine-year-old kid that uh, developed a successful business model. We hear about the 12-year-old boy that made a bionic arm, and I thought, there's no way I can do that. And my path through academia thus far has, uh, has really been very conventional. I did my high school degree, um, finished at 17, went right into my undergraduate degree in health sciences, which was basically a pre-med course, uh, or a, a pre-med uh, pre degree. And to me, looking back at it, that was absolutely crazy. I made a four-year commitment, a $25,000 commitment, um, without even knowing who I was or what I, what I wanted to do. And I started to really realize that uh, in my third year where I started talking with um, people that I went to school with, and they all wanted to be medical doctors, chiropractors, optometry. I felt no drive to do that whatsoever. And we have all had this question that we hate. What are you doing after your undergraduate degree? I can uh, imagine, and if I actually, I'll ask right now. Put your hand up if you like that question, even if you're a graduate degree. Okay, there's none. No one likes that question because it's a dumb question. <laughs> We were supposed to come up with an answer for what are you going to do for the rest 50 odd years of your life at 21, 22 years old if you went to school like me right after high school, or sorry, right after, yeah, right after high school. And it's just absolutely ridiculous. So I thought at that point, um, I might drop out. I don't want to go to school anymore. I printed off the forms. I filled them out. I needed a signature. Really, that's all I really wanted to do. Um, I wanted to be a professional golfer. I absolutely loved golf through high school. I was great at it. Um, I don't think I would have been as competitive if I decided to go down that route, but I loved to instruct. I loved watching people progress. Um, I did a lot of long drive competitions. I, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, and it was really actually, it was about the day after I printed off the forms and I filled them all out. I was gonna to go to the dean, I was gonna drop out. Um, I had a chat with this guy. He's gonna hate me for having such a flattering picture of him up there, but Dr. Trevor Day. He was a professor of mine in human physiology, one of the courses that I actually enjoyed. And uh, we got along really well. He was starting up a research program and he wanted someone that he could work with because he sure, he sure didn't ask me because, uh, because of my grades, because they were lackluster. But um, we got along quite well. So we thought we could work together for the summer. And he asked me to be his physiology research assistant. And I was really reluctant at first. I didn't want to do it. I didn't think I was smart enough. However, I had this revolutionary thought that now, that I didn't realize at, the same t at that time, but um, I realized that it was probably one of the biggest turning points in my life. I thought, why can't I do that? If I saw another research, research, uh, research assistants down the hallway, I saw them doing it, why couldn't I do that as well? So I started applying this concept and method or this ideology um, to everything I did. And it, uh, so it started with this really. I owned a 1987 Pontiac Fiero when I was uh, 18 years old. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, it was a two-seater, so I could pick up one girl with me. And uh, if anyone knows this vehicle, they have a ton of problems. They are a pain to work on because the engine's in the back, and my car happened to need a new engine. I had no mechanical skills, could barely take off a tire at this point, um, but I decided to give it a shot. I didn't want to pay a mechanic to do something that I thought maybe I could do myself. So I did a lot of reading. I took out the engine. I broke a lot of stuff I shouldn't have. I failed, and then I had to replace, it actually cost me a lot of money because I had to replace so many things on it. But um, I ended up replacing the engine, and uh, 
Car fired back up, um, and it only had four bolts left over. It still worked, and I really, and this is actually, uh, I'm, I'm, this is true, um, I really apologize to the guy if he's watching this video right now or when, when this goes online because there's no way the guy who bought it from me is having a good time with this vehicle. <laughs> I then um, applied this into construction as well. I, uh, I started doing landscaping for jobs in, my, in the summer during my undergraduate degree. I basically just mowed lawns, so <laughs> I wouldn't really call it landscaping. But um, we had a construction crew as well. They built walls, they built patios. I've seen them built. I've never built one myself. But uh, my parents, they bought a new house and it was just basically dirt in the backyard. And I thought, well, it doesn't look that difficult. I'll, I'll give it a try. So I, uh, I bought a whole bunch of stone. I did, a, again, a bunch of reading, talked to a ton of people. And I designed my parents' backyard. Um, here's a picture, obviously, you need help when you're, when you're digging things and you're putting in rock. Um, this is my buddy, uh, his name's Ewick here. Um, I got my buddy Valentine, and I know what you're asking yourselves right now, is Valentine single? And yes, he is very single. So I, if you want to talk afterwards, I can, uh, I can get into that. But this is what I ended up building. It took a year and a half. I designed it myself, and uh, it took uh, yeah, a lot of work, a lot of labor. Um, I screwed up tons of times. I had to rebuild those walls tons of times. And um, put in a putting green as well, because I love golf. So what, uh, what happened at this point? It was a big change from year three to year four in my undergraduate degree. I was starting to become innovative, starting to become passionate. I was, I was thinking I can do things I never thought I could before, and I was prepared to fail. I was failing all the time. I failed with building those walls. I failed with, with, uh, um, with my car when I was rebuilding. And this is a concept that's, that's, not, uh, that's not really accepted by a lot of undergraduate students because if you fail, if you fail a midterm, if you fail a final, then you get held back. You can't progress. However, you need to fail in order to move forward. And this is what I was starting to learn at this point, and I wish I learned it earlier. And the, the second most important thing I learned um, at this point is I started to develop this uh, innovative method called serendipitous innovation. I don't know if, you've, if any of you have heard that. Um, it's essentially a way of innovating by just stumbling upon, um, a, uh, stumbling upon a finding. But recognizing that finding is what's important. And probably the most uh, famous story of serendipitous innovation is the story of penicillin, where in 1928, Dr. Alexander Fleming, he came back from vacation and he saw that his lab was a complete mess. He liked to, it, was, it was actually quite infamous. He, he kept his lab a mess. But um, he started throwing things out, but he noticed in the garbage can um, there was a bacteria assay in there, full of, obviously you had bacteria in there, but there was a piece of fungi that was in the middle of the bacteria assay that was resistant to the bacteria within the assay. So what did this mean? Um, he questioned himself, so he, uh, he took that fungi, he cultured it, and basically it turned out to be penicillin, which is most widely used antibiotic today. He won the Nobel uh, Prize in Medicine in 1945. But when, you, when you, it comes down to it, I think most people would have just thrown that garbage out. But he had the ability to recognize that something was different, something was important within that garbage, uh, within that garbage can. So how did I first apply this serendipitous innovation, or innovation through recognition, as, uh, as I call it as well? Um, it started with this. I was tasked to build a lower body negative pressure chamber. This one's actually here at UBC Okanagan. And it's used for a lot of military research, brain research, cardiovascular research. Basically, we put the participant laying down in the box so their lower half is within the box. And we turn on a pump and the pressure within the box lowers and blood starts to pool down into their legs. So it basically simulates blood loss without actually them losing blood, which is great. This one was built by NASA, so I obviously had uh, anywhere to go but up with my building. <laughs> and this is what I built. Obviously, it's the economical version of it. And there's no real guide on, or instructions on how to build these things. So I had to come up with my own plan. And basically, what I would do is I would go into a hardware store, and I'd just walk up and down the aisles until I recognized something. And be like, I can use that for this. I can use this for this. Instead of looking at a piece of plumbing, I saw it as a piece of something that I could put, manufacture or put into this box. Um, instead of a, a pump, I used a shop vac that I just hooked up to the box. Instead of software to run it, I had a dial to turn on, to turn on the box. And uh, I want to show you what 
Um, this is the only science-y slide I have, so bear with me. Um, I want to show you what these boxes do. So on the top channel is heart rate, and then we have blood pressure, and then brain blood flow on the bottom one. So as soon as we apply this pressure to the person's lower half, right where this line is, you see heart rate's climbing. It just keeps climbing almost as if they're exercising. And it does this in order to maintain your blood pressure. But then you hit a certain point where everything just crashes. You lose too much blood. So if we would have kept this box on, their heart would have stopped. So we have to, obviously, we have to know when to, when to turn it off. So you see everything crashes, heart rate drops, blood pressure plummets. plummets. But if you look at brain blood flow, it's uh, able to regulate quite well. And I was fascinated by this. Why is the brain so greedy with, with blood? How, how is it able to regulate over such, um, such a stress such as this? So then I was a third year, I was just getting into research. Um, I, can't, I couldn't really develop my own really uh, significantly well done research questions, but I was, uh, was having fun with it. So we thought, what happens when you flip people upside down and you drain you know, blood into their legs? So that's what I did. I built one of these on, uh, so on an axle so we can basically flip them upside down and apply lower body negative pressure to them. Now the issue, with this box is that obviously they're upside down. Obviously this apparatus is extremely heavy and this is the only one of its, of its kind. Um, so if something breaks, I'm gonna have my friends falling on top of their heads because there's no one else I can get to do these things. I have to be my friends. Everyone <laughs> sees that and it looks absolutely terrifying. But if you notice here, there's just this metal base here. I had no idea how I was gonna build a base that was gonna be strong enough. So I, walk, I did my thing, I was walking up and down hardware aisles until I came uh, across a big pile of lumber and I was just standing on this metal piece and then it hit me. What I was standing on was actually perfect for what I needed it. And I, was, I started to recognize it. I'm like, yep, this is what I need. So I tried to buy it from them. They wouldn't sell it to me. Um, so I went to uh, another hardware store. I bought a MIG welder, learned how to weld. I bought some scrap metal. So I, I spent some time learning how to weld and then I, uh, I built the base myself. And we actually took it to the Aztec Awards, which is a science awards in Alberta. Um, they, uh, they uh, gave me a Young Innovator Award, and this is my buddy Lindsay um, that I convinced again the box where basically every 30 minutes people would walk by and I'd turn on the box and I'd make him pass out. Um, <laughs> funny story with this, if you see his headpiece, he actually has, uh, that, that's an ultrasound probe where we're measuring brain blood flow. Um, I forgot ultrasound gel, so I had to run to Shoppers Drug Mart and I had to get KY jelly. <laughs> And the only way he would do it, he said, you have to give me a glass of champagne. So this is him with a glass of champagne with KY jelly on his head. And that's something that you all now know. So we collected a ton of data with it, and I presented it in the UK. And that, uh, that research uh, manuscript is going to be coming out sometime this summer. So I kind of became known as the box guy. So UBC employed me in order to build some positive pressure boxes. Um, which is a completely different stress. So I had to build metal frames. I made it a triangle. Honestly, it was much difficult to make the triangle. I just wanted to do something different and uh, I should have just done a box. Um, but we made two of these positive pressure chambers. One's at UBC here and the other one was sent to Duke University to do brain research and cardiovascular research as well. So I was a fourth year at this point. I was becoming very innovative. I was passionate. I loved what I did. Um, and because of that, um, lots of opportunities started to come to me. And if there's any mountaineers in this room, um, you notice that that peak right there is the highest peak in the world. That's Mount Everest. And I didn't climb it. Just so you all know, um, I visited base camp and the highest I got to was about 600 meters. But I was invited on the Nepal research expedition that we at UBC held for 2012. There was 23 investigators um, from six different countries, but they had an issue. They needed an, an exercise bike they wanted to do some exercise studies, three or four of them. Uh, there was about 20 studies overall done in Nepal at high altitude, but they needed a bike where they needed the person laying down, we had to measure uh, power, power output, um, cadence. Um, it had to be lightweight because we had to carry it 70 kilometers up with us. It had to be portable. Um, now I'm gonna show you some pictures of what I came up with and I wanna disclose very clearly that I am not an engineer because there's probably engineers in the crowd and you're gonna see what I'm gonna show you and it's somewhat embarrassing. But it worked. So this was prototype one. I'll show you some prototypes. I, uh, I bought some metal because now I can weld and I put together these parts, uh, or these sections of the bike frame that can all be unbolted. I went to Walmart, I bought the cheapest bike that I could possibly and I cut it up, mounted it onto this bike frame. 
we needed something to induce exercise intensity, so I found a cycle trainer, essentially right here, at, uh, basically we would, that would put on an exercise workload on the subjects, and then here's the final result. Um, it needed to be, so it wasn't as portable as we wanted to because it was heavy, but it fit, up, it fit into a bunch of uh, basically luggage and cases that we brought up with us that was carried up by yaks and porters. Um, we did a bunch of baseline testing here in Kelowna, um, actually just the medical building here, on all of us. Uh, we arrived in Nepal, and if you see something that's a little bit funny about this picture, is that they had Walmart in Nepal. They're everywhere. So I really didn't even need to build a bike here. I could have just gone to Nepal, and it was literally 100 paces from where we were staying, and I found a Walmart. This was all of our equipment that we brought with us that was uh, basically put on yaks and carried up. So it tons, it was just chaos in the hotel. And we finally arrived at this uh, laboratory built by the Italians in the early 1900s, or sorry, 1990s. Uh, I took this picture as upon arrival, and we used my bike that I built from scratch um, to investigate in lung blood flow, um, heart mechanics during exercise. Uh, we also did some exercise in brain blood flow work. And very interesting here, this guy is smiling in the, in the bottom right hand corner, yet he has a catheter that's in his jugular vein that's fed up to the base of his brain. He has a probe going in his, uh, through his nose down into his esophagus. He has another catheter in his wrist and he has two ultrasound techs that are in his, in his neck um, basically scanning different arteries while right before he's about to do a maximum exercise test at high altitude. But he's smiling. So this is um, my last slide and my favorite photo of the whole trip. This is the whole group of us together with the Sherpa team as well that we took. Um, what I showed you today was my transformation of being a third year student and how I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life at all. I was days within days of dropping out and then I somehow, I found passion, I found uh, ways to innovate in order, um, uh, ways to innovate and it all started with, uh, you can see me, I'm the mildly obese guy in the green and then uh, my physiology prof right behind him, sorry, right behind me. And this all started with one question that he asked me, was to be his research assistant. And, uh, and uh, I hope that this inspires some of the undergrads or any of the students here today that if you have bad grades or if uh, you have very average grades, don't worry, opportunities come. Maybe, uh, maybe that one conversation that was very special to me is gonna happen to you soon. Or maybe you've already had it and it's, uh, you just haven't recognized it yet.